Nephrolithiasis is the topic, and nephrolithiasis are essentially referring to uh, kidney stones. And kidney stones are a uh, very uh, painful uh, occurrence. And the composition is very important. About 85% of kidney stones are calcium stones. And this number varies. Some say 80, some say whatever, 75. 10% are uric acid. And then you have uh, a small percentage that are cysteine stones. And then a very small percentage are um, known as uh, struvite stones. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is by far the most common. Now, why does this happen? For calcium stones, the most common etiology or risk factor is when you have a lot of calcium in your urine. And that is known as hypercalciuria. When you have a lot of calcium in the urine, that can lead to calcium stones. So that is the biggest risk factor for the calcium stones. Another risk factor for calcium stones is when you have a low amount of citrate, which is known as hypocitruria. And the reason is because citrate normally binds to calcium uh, and inhibits uh, the formation of these uh, calcium uh, salts. But if you have a low amount of citrate in the urine, it can lead to uh, the calcium just being free and forming uh, a stone. Another type of uh, reason you can get is for uric acid uh, stones. A common reason is when you have a very acidic pH, when the urine acidity is very high. So uh, we normally talk about acidity in terms of pH. So if the pH of the urine is like less than 5.5, you can get uric acid stones. And then really quickly, I wanted to touch on the magnesium or struvite stones. Struvite stones are very interesting in that they are caused by bacteria. And the bacteria uh, that we're referring to are Proteus and Klebsiella. And they, they talk a lot about this on the licensing exams, even though it's such a rare occurrence. Struvite stones caused by Proteus or Klebsiella are uh, commonly tested. So talk a little bit about the uh, kidney uh, um, in terms of its uh, uh, anatomy. Basically, you have uh, a system where the the stone can be pretty much anywhere. And there's, a, of course, kidneys on both sides here. Now the stone, I'll use, uh, I use brown for a stone. The stone can be anywhere. It can be in the renal parenchyma, it can be in the renal pelvis in here, or it can be in the ureter, or it can be in the bladder. Now, some uh, important numbers. If the diameter of the stone is greater than five millimeters, it could get lodged, so it could eventually get stuck. If the diameter is less than five, less than or equal to five millimeters, it's most likely to pass spontaneously. So just remember those numbers on the licensing exams. Symptoms? Well, uh, kidney stones are sort of described as the male equivalent of child labor. Uh, you know, it's extremely painful. Uh, pain in the flank area, which makes sense because that's where the kidney is. And it tends to come and go. It's sort of cyclical. Uh, in about 20 to 60 minutes. It lasts 20 to 60 minutes and then goes away. Also, you have uh, some nonspecific symptoms such as nausea and vomiting. You can even, the pain can even radiate. Uh, the pain can radiate across the abdomen. And another thing that's important to remember that you'll see on the licensing exams is that there's uh, inability to uh, sit still. Uh, the patient will be in so much pain that they're constantly shifting. Um, and then the patient can also sometimes prevent, uh, present with diaphoresis, which is uh, excessive sweating. So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable. Diagnosis. Um, there's really um, sort of four main things that you do. The first one, of course, is just the clinical uh, presentation and the history. Because a lot of times the stones are recurrent. Uh, 
so if the person's had stones before, it makes the diagnosis actually quite easy. If it's the first time, then a very common test, of course, is a urine analysis. You want to rule out any kind of urinary tract infection, bladder infection, things like that. But by far, the most uh, important test to diagnose this is an imaging study. And the imaging study is a CT, CT of the abdomen. They'll try to trick you by putting in an x-ray, but an x-ray uh, should be avoided because it's not the, the best test. The imaging study is the uh, main study, uh, in particular uh, CT of the abdomen. The fourth and final thing I wanted to mention in the diagnostic process is that once you obtain the stone, you have to send it for analysis. And the reason is we want to know what is the chemical composition. Is it a calcium stone? Is it a uric acid stone? Uh, Etc. And we want to know the chemical composition because that's going to help us in treatment and prevention uh, so that this doesn't happen again. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. Well, when treatment is initiated, the very first thing that you do is pain management with analgesia because it's unbelievably painful. Most commonly used uh, pain meds uh, in the hospital setting are morphine, and there's other ones as well. The next thing is you want to try to uh, help uh, the patient pass um, the stone uh, before you do any kind of invasive uh, treatment. So this is known as medical expulsive therapy and it just involves basic medications and the, the medication that's most commonly used is called the alpha receptor blocker and uh, the most commonly used one is tamsulosin. And what this medication does is it allows a dilation and uh, it facilitates the stone passing now, if this is ineffective, then you get into the third thing, which is calculus removal, stone removal. And stone removal um, involves sort of two, way, two schools of thought. The first one is an invasive way, and the, sec the first one is actually a non-invasive way and the second one is invasive. So first you try the non-invasive. Non-invasive involves something known as lithotripsy. And lithotripsy essentially is just a technique where they use a, a, a procedure that breaks up the stone without being invasive. And then once the stone is broken up, it can pass spontaneous, spontaneously. They use these shock waves to uh, break the stone up. The more invasive way is if you have a very large stone, um, and um, that is done with an endoscope that's inserted. If a stone is, uh, you know, less than one centimeter, you can probably uh, do the lithotripsy. If it's larger, and lithotripsy has been tried and it's unsuccessful, then you probably have to. Um, go into a more invasive procedure and um, that's where the endoscope uh, is used to in insert and try to um, remove the stone. Prevention. Prevention is very important uh, because uh, stones can reoccur over and over again and there's one the most important part of prevention is with calcium stones Remember, calcium stones happen because you have a lot of calcium in the urine. And uh, that condition is known as hypercalciuria. Now, you want to prevent this from happening. You don't want the patient to have a lot of calcium in their urine. So how do you do that? Well, you give them a medication that increases calcium reabsorption. So it the medication increases the reabsorption of calcium back into the bloodstream instead of uh, kicking out the calcium in the urine. And that medication is known as a thiazide diuretic. This is a very, very popular medication and uh, commonly used to help lower urine calcium um, uh, excretion 
uh, to lower uh, the urine calcium levels. So let's take a look at some vignettes and see what this looks like. 37-year-old male returns to follow-up uh, after episode of kidney stones. He passed a 3 millimeter calcium oxalate stone and requests information about preventing further stones. You would advise him that. Well, let's go through these. Drink up to 2 liters of water a day. Definitely very common advice. Uh, increasing water intake can definitely help uh, pass uh, small, very small stones. Increase his consumption of meats and grains. Well, that's bad advice because you actually want to decrease the consumption of meats and grains um, because that uh, the, the protein uh, can contribute. Increase the level of fructose in his diet. Uh, that's probably not good advice. And restrict foods high in oxalate such as spinach and rhubarb. This actually has not uh, been shown to be effective in reducing stone formation. So by process of elimination, it's eight. Second question, 44-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of excruciating left flank pain that radiates to his left testicle. He describes the pain as coming in waves, and he says, this is the worst pain I've had in my life, and that includes closing my thumb in the truck door. On physical exam, he is extremely restless and is and in obvious pain. Genitalia are normal. Abdomen exam is normal except for intermittent guarding with spas spasms of pain. Plain x-ray of the film is normal. UA is normal. Most appropriate diagnostic study is. Well, he obviously has kidney stones, uh, nephrolithiasis. And even if you didn't know that, or even if you don't know that for sure, um, they've already given you that he's already had a plain x-ray, and that's normal. But remember, x-rays are not the best um, imaging study. If you want to really uh, go after this diagnosis of kidney stones, you have to do a CT of the abdomen. And that would be choice uh, D. Because, you know, he's he's already had a UA, and it's normal. And he's in so much pain that, generally speaking, a, a urinary tract infection wouldn't cause that much pain. So you are definitely trying to chase a diagnosis of kidney stones. Next question. A 31-year-old comes to the physician's office two weeks after being seen in the emergency room for acute nephrolithiasis. He passed a stone in the emergency room and reports that it was made of calcium oxalate. He is concerned about recurrences as the pain was very severe. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? Okay, well, this is a perfect question. Remember, 80% of stones, 85% are due to calcium. And the most important reason a person can get uh, calcium stones is hypercalciuria, which means high levels of uh, calcium in the urine. Now, you want to prevent this. So you want to give a medication that's going to help increase uh, calcium reabsorption. Instead of having the calcium uh, kicked out into the urine, you want it absorbed back into the bloodstream. So how do you do that? You do that with a thiazide diuretic. And a thiazide diuretic is used to prevent uh, the uh, reoccurrence of calcium stones. These thiazide diuretics decrease the urine calcium levels and therefore decrease the rate of calcium stone formation. So that would be choice A. And finally, a 54-year-old woman has a severe ureteral colic. Uh, IV pylogram shows a 7 millimeter ure ureteral stone at the ureteropelvic junction. She has a normal coagulation profile. Which of the following would be most likely best therapy in this case? All right, well, let's go through these one by one. Um, seven millimeters is kind of big. Remember, there was that cutoff, five. If they're less than five, they most likely will pass spontaneously. But uh, if they're greater than five, they have uh, more uh, propensity to get lodged. So just giving fluids and awaiting spontaneous passage is not probably the right way. So now you've got two choices here. Well, you got three, but the reason I say two is because they're kind of in two categories. The first one is what you have is a non-invasive, right? And the next two are involving these endoscopes, uh, so they're invasive. So. Uh, 
the key is if some if a stone is one centimeter or less, then it's very possible that the use of the lithotripsy will be beneficial. If it's one centimeter or less, the lithotripsy is the first option. So we definitely have a stone that's less than um, one centimeter, so lithotripsy is the first option. And uh, for larger stones, uh, if you use lithotripsy and it's unsuccessful, then you can go to these retrograde uh, invasive tests and um, where you uh, insert the endoscope and then you try to remove the stone.